Duke Boone. Hey, good afternoon. Thanks for coming back from lunch. L Lou talked this morning about New Relic One and how we are the first open, connected, programmable observability platform. So I'm going to dig in a little bit more about how we've been thinking about observability, how you might want to start thinking about observability, and how New Relic One is really focused on being connected. Lou talked a lot about programmability. I'm going to dig in a little bit more into connected. And then I'm going to welcome to the stage one of our customers, and we're going to hear from him what they're doing, some of their challenges, and how New Relic One is helping them. So this word observability kind of sprung into our, into our, our discipline, our domain, the software engineering world a few years ago. And I think when a word takes an industry by storm like that, there's something behind it, right? There is some reason that people started really gripping this, world, this word and talking about what it meant and why it was important. And some of those things were changes in technology changes in how we build software, more people being on call, more people dealing with the struggles of understanding ever more complex systems. And so people were finding that they had new needs. And when we have something new to talk about, we have to give it a word, right? We have to be able to, to have a thing that we can hold on to. But then because we're software engineers, we argue about what that word means. If, if the hardest problem in computer science is naming, uh, things, which it probably is. The second hardest is teleconferencing. It used to be printing, but we just solved that by having everyone stop printing things. Um, so we love to, we love, you know, we care. We're, we're, we're about precision. So we started talking about observability because we already had this word monitoring. So then we said, well, are they different? Is one a subset of the other? Do I have to choose sides? Do people need to be either for observability or for monitoring? Do tools have to be one or the other? And I think in that discussion, we lost some of what really matters behind that, which is that what was behind everyone starting to talk about this? What were the problems we were trying to solve? What was the need that our industry had? And so I want to suggest a different way of thinking about this and say that there's maybe just two things that matter. And the first is visibility. Can I see everything I need to see? Do I have all the data there? And then once I have all the data there, can I answer the questions that I need to ask? Because you can send billions of traces, you can send billions of metrics, and you can have terabytes of log data, but if you can't inquire into it, if you can't reason about it, construct mental models in your head about it so that you can really understand it, then that data is not helping you. You have to be able to ask questions and work with a system that gives you the ability to have those questions answered. And I think a useful way then to think about it when you're thinking about how to set up your tooling, how to set up your observability and monitoring systems, how to build this into your practices every day, is to think about the architecture and the job, the architecture that you're running and the jobs that you're trying to do. And I'm going to click into this by I'm using an example, a metaphor, because it's a talk. You've got to have some pictures and some metaphors. And I'm going to use cars, because I like cars. And these are both two cars I've had the pleasure of owning and driving at different points in my life. One is a 2005 Lotus Elise, very fast. Very good in the corners. Some trunk space. You could go away for a week if you were really careful about what you were planning. Really hard to get in and out of, um, but a ton of fun to drive. And then a Jeep Grand Cherokee. Very high clearance, four-wheel drive. Here I am, I am in Death Valley, taking it off-road. Got to see bighorn sheep, because I could take that car into the back, back alleys of Death Valley and, and see things that I couldn't see from the road. And so our software architectures are like this. We make different choices about the tech stacks and tools to use because we need to go different places in our software. We, don't come, we come to work to build the software for our customers, right? And we want to be able to bring the right architecture to that job. And often in our garages, you know, just I own both of these cars at the same time, often in our tech stacks, they're very seldom actually homogenous. They're usually heterogeneous because either you've made conscious choices to choose different solutions or 
over time, it's just happened. If you work for a company that's over five years old, I can guarantee you that you have a heterogeneous technical environment. If you work for a company that's less than a year old, maybe, right? So that's it. Think about your architectures. Think about the things you need to see across any tech stack. And then think about the job. So keeping with our car metaphor, this is a picture of the Williams F1 team. They were the first Formula One team to perform a pit stop in less than two seconds. Right? And if you've never watched an F1 pit stop, I don't care if you don't like cars, if you don't like racing, just go on YouTube and Google like F1 pit stop and just watch a couple. It will take two seconds. Um, and it's amazing because each of these people has a job to be done and they know what that job is. One person's job is just to remove the right front tire. Another person's job is just to put the new right front tire on. They're working together, right, to accomplish a goal. But they're also using data to inform that goal. The race engineers have been watching and they know what tires to put on. The people are taking in telemetry data. They're getting requests from the driver. You can see there's two people there kind of swarmed around the driver, making sure he's got what he needs. They may have just gotten, found out that there was a kerfuffle in turn two and they need to replace the nose. So whatever's going on, here's a group of people using data to work very fast to win as a team. So does that sound familiar? Does that sound a little bit like what we do when we come to work? If you're on a DevOps team, if you're working across an enterprise building software with thousands of engineers, you've got a group of people using data to work very fast to win as a team. Because they're not coming to work to change the tire, they're coming to work to win the race. Just like you're coming to work to build more perfect software. So I wanna to propose to you that you don't have to pick a side in the observability wars. Because I don't think it's a question of monitoring or observability. It's a matter of yes and. Yes, I wanna build great software and I want the tools to be able to answer the questions no matter what tech stack I'm running. So with that then, let's turn and talk a little bit more about New Relic One and what we're doing there. When we say it's the first open, connected, programmable platform. I want to dig in more on the connected side. So we've talked also, sometimes we talk about New Relic being an entity-centric platform, and what do we mean by that? So when Lou announced this morning how now we have this open platform where you can send your metrics, logs, and traces, all of that's coming in to the same back end, into the same system where we can start to model it and reason about it. And there it sits alongside the data that we're already gathering for you from on-host and cloud integrations. We have over 200 on-host uh, and cloud integrations today that send this data into our back end. And then of course our agents, our APM, client side, and infrastructure agents are also gathering data. And you'll see that in addition to the sort of holy trinity some people sometimes talk about with observability, to metrics, logs, and traces we add events. And events are important because they capture a single moment in time, a single thing that occurred in your system. And New Relic generates a lot of these automatically for you to give you error information and transaction information and so forth. But you have the same control over events that you do over your metrics, logs, and traces. So if you can observe it, you can use the events API to send that data in. So if you're monitoring a Kafka queue and you wanna get some deep state information about that, if you wanna know every checkout that goes through your thing, you can create an event for that. Anything you can observe, you can create an event for. And that's why we consider them a first class data object and we keep them in that same um, model so that we can reason and store and connect that data. So how does this turn out? Well, let's go back to that, that thing of questions. All these folks are coming to work. Throughout the day, we have different questions we need to ask in order to keep our systems running and happy. So the first one might be, what's making my customer unhappy? I got an alert, I got a page, somebody called me, somebody's not happy, the website's slow, it's broken, something's not going on. And to be able to see in a cross-account service map how everything is connected, the state of everything, let you uh, get to the root of that, uh, the answer to that question more quickly. And you can also ask variations on that question. You can ask things like, is it me or is it them? Now, when I was on call, that was always just like, did I break it or did someone else break me? Um, or you can flip that question on its head and say, hey, if I take this system down or if I make a change 
Who else might I affect? And you can understand those dependencies across your whole system because you've got a connected platform that's looking end to end in this example, which is a New Relic example, we're monitoring all the way out to Apple TV, our iOS, Android, as well as our browser, and then all the way through to our back end. So we can see how everything's connected across 70 teams on three continents. So another common question is how did my deployments go? Now in New Relic, we've had deployment markers for years. It's really easy. You can use a simple API to drop a deployment marker, know exactly when a deployment happened. And you can see these in the APM UI, or you can see these in New Relic 1. So why is this important? It's important because it lets you now answer a bunch of questions that were hard to answer before, simply be because you've got that data point right there on the chart. And here you can see our friend G. Parker here. He or she, they, um, had a deployment, and things, in fact, went south. Things did not get better, they got worse. And then uh, they went on, they did a rollback, and then suddenly things are back to normal. And now that story is there, it's in my system, I can see, and I can ask that question of what happened. Oh, there was a deployment. Did we fix it? Yeah, we rolled that change back, and look. So deployment markers, again, something we've had for years. If you're not using them, I highly encourage you to do that um, for the visibility it gives you. If you are using them, I'm happy to share, we've just shipped a small improvement. We, one of the things you asked for was the ability to set the time for a deployment explicitly rather than it just being relying on when the API hit our system. So now with the latest version, you can set that time, get a little more power into those queries. So with that, I wanna click in and look briefly then at some things that are coming up. We talked a lot about what's already in our platform with the new announcements today, with things that we've had, like service maps and deployments. Let's look ahead, though, a little bit more. Connected entities. So as that data is coming into New Relic today, now you've got it all in one place. You've got all your metrics, event log, and, and trace data in one place, no matter where it came from. But where we're going is we're going to start connecting that data. So if you are using our open instrumentation tools and you're, say, sending metrics from a system and you're sending traces from that same uh, app or piece of software, that's really the same app or piece of software. You want to see it and reason about it and see it on a map the same way you would see something that's sending uh, data from an agent. So that's where we're going. That is our future, is to start to build on top of this a layer of understanding and intelligence and connection to make that open instrumentation platform even more useful for you. Yesterday, I was at our customer advisory board meeting. We had 11 customers uh, in the room um, who come and they give us feedback and ask us hard questions, and we love to be able to spend time with them. And two of our custom one of our customers said, you know, what I really need my company, we think about our systems in terms of platforms, like for each different business unit, there's like a set of systems that really supports them. And another customer said, yeah, I, I really think about personas, like different personas within my company in, in engineering, they need to be able to see things differently. They need to maybe to just see the things that their team's responsible for, because maybe they're a full stack, stack, full stack DevOps team. I can, get, I can say that. Um, or maybe they're a pure ops team and they just want to see the metal. But whatever it is, like they need different perspectives. And that's what uh, we're working on a new feature called workloads will solve. Because what a workload is, is it lets you dynamically identify a set of systems, again, across any type of entity, so app, front end, back end, infrastructure, integrations, and see it all in one place. So in this example from our beta, you're seeing that uh, real-time metrics across account, across different types of entities, and seeing all that status and information in one place. So this is going into uh, private beta next month down in our infrastructure booth. We're showing demos. We're also signing people up for early access. If you'd like to be in the early access, run over to the infrastructure booth at the break. They would love to talk to you. So this is how, with New Relic's new platform, by being open and connected and programmable, we're providing you the observability tools you need to solve the problems, to do the jobs, to answer the questions that you have. And so you don't have to pick a side. You can focus on building more perfect software. And with that, I'm happy to now welcome to the stage one of our customers, Glenn Nethercutt. Hey, Glenn. Hey. 
So Gwen and I have known each other almost three years, almost as long as I've been at New Relic. He was one of the first customers who took me aside and said, let me tell you about this beta that you're showing me. I got some opinions, um, and it's been great. We love having customers like that. I do have opinions. You do. That's why you're here. So Glenn, why don't you tell us what you do, what Genesis Pure Cloud does, and then what you do there. Uh, sure. Uh, so Genesis is in the, the CX business, um, maybe more specifically. Uh, we are a technology company that focuses on like powering the world's best customer experiences. Um, so anytime a brand reaches out to customers, there's a good chance that you're using some software that we've written. Uh, so you might not know us necessarily, maybe you do, uh, but you certainly know companies that we, we kind of empower with our CX platform. Everything from bellwethers like uh, uh, Coca-Cola or a Microsoft uh, to companies like Uber or AstraZeneca or Ticketmaster, for example. How many engineers or engineering teams do you have, do you think, at Genesis? Ooh, uh, well, we are a company that's about, let's see, we, uh, we have about 5,000 employees, and about 1,000 okay. partners. Um, we are servicing customers from 100 different countries and have about 11,000 of those customers. So a pretty, pretty good-sized development shop, yep. okay. uh, and, and we invest a lot on the technology side, I'd say. Yeah, so what do you do there? Yeah, uh, chief chief architect, uh, tech fellow, um, cat herder, I suppose is another way to say it. Uh, everything from um, architectural reviews and sort of looking at the tech landscape and seeing where we need to invest. Uh, sometimes it's uh, looking at embedding new cloud technologies, uh, helping teams actually understand uh, concise and reliable ways to deploy code at scale, um, and, and even owning some of the teams that are enabling that, whether it's SRE teams, and for us that means teams that actually build the tools that do SRE, not that they are an ops team, they are an enabling team. Uh, so I own uh, that part of the business. Gotcha. So we were talking before about how you know, technology always changes, and with that comes new challenges. So what are some of the changes that you've been making in your tech stack lately, and the reasons why, the benefits you're seeing, and then the challenges that you've had to deal with? Sure. Um, so we've been uh, microservices and event driven for more than five years. So I, I think we made the bet fairly early, at least within our space, we made the bet very early uh, on, on doing that. Uh, more recently, our, our transition has been from microservices that were immutable, EC2 based, very ephemeral, uh, to serverless. Mm -hmm. uh, so a big part of our observability journey is kind of getting continuity on the metrics and, and how we actually look at emergent system behavior uh, using tools like New Relic. Gotcha. Oh. Have there been any particular challenges you've had as you've moved like through that journey? Like anything that lessons learned? Nope, all easy. Oh, good. Good to know. Piece that of cake. You can leave False. Now. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, we, uh, we invested a lot in the early days with, um, with cross-app tracing uh, mm -hmm. with, with CAT uh, and New Relic, which is sort of the I like to think of it as the predecessor to yeah. distributed tracing. That's fair. Um, and we needed to, but there were still always gaps. There were still always parts of the system through which data flowed, whether uh, we're talking like a managed tier, say something like a, a message queue, a managed mm -hmm. message queue from your cloud vendor, um, to other even systems that we maintain, like a Kafka, for example. Mm -hmm. So seeing kind of this connected view of our world has always been a challenge. Uh, but we've sort of known since the beginning uh, that we needed to invest in observability. It's, it's definitely forethought for us. Um, so that's, that's, that's been a big, a big part of our investment. Oh. How, how then has your thinking about like, monitoring and observability changed over the years? Have you, and how have you sort of been leading? I know you do a lot with your teams to lead them through the change, whether it's through uh, cat herding or tools that you're building. How, but has your own thinking about the space changed? Uh, to some degree, yeah, it's uh, it, it certainly started probably the way that uh, many in the room have kind of come to New Relic, where it's uh, focused on a kind of a triage lens mm -hmm. and triage framing. So we were really catered towards our engineering teams as consumers of it, uh, and that sort of shaped how we use the product, how we use the tools that were available to us. But we've continually tried to move up that value stack as well. Uh, so we didn't stop with engineering. We now have our support and care organizations, for example, we use New Relic to understand customer impact uh, during any type of uh, event or rollout that our customers are doing. Like what, what type of uh, experience are they having at that micro level? CSMs do the same thing to understand the sort of changing shape of how our customers are using our platform. Mm -hmm. uh, the product teams have started to use uh, New Relic to understand rollouts, uh, adoption across different parts of the globe. Uh, all the way up to the to the C-suite, using us to understand just how the business is doing from a, a 
either sometimes general health standpoint or often a growth mm -hmm. standpoint. So do you have execs logging in and looking at dashboards, or are you sort of ext extracting and sending them data that's more consumed in a different form? Uh, both, both. Yeah. Um, our, our EVP on the pure cloud side, which that's the part of our business that's, um, that is kind of closest near and near to my heart. It's the, uh, the public cloud offering part of it. Uh, the EVP for that, yeah, he absolutely has a, uh, a, a dashboard and certainly looks all the time. Um, our new CEO uh, mm -hmm. also asked for logins fairly quickly upon coming okay. on staff. So I would say, yeah, there's, there's certain attraction at the executive level, uh, but our login rates at the engineering level is, is kind of off the, off the charts. Gotcha. Um, so I know you've had folks involved with the programmability work. Lou uh, name-checked one of your engineers this morning mm -hmm. about one of the apps that, were released, that we released today. Um, so what have you been like hearing from engineers? I don't know if you've actually gotten your own hands on, if you've either been coding yourself or if you're hearing from engineers. What, what are you hearing from them, and how do you see this helping Genesis? Well, yeah, forward? I definitely got my hands on it before, before I let, before right, I let them do it. Lou came and, that's right, Lou came and did your own private nerd hack. Why don't you he tell did, folks did. about that? He did. Yeah, that was, that was early days, I think, when we were still trying to understand exactly what, uh, it was just nerdlets then, not nerd yeah. pack yet. Yes. Uh, and we didn't have all the tools, but uh, we already saw the value in it. Mm -hmm. Um, like I say, we've, we've sort of always leveraged New Relic as a platform, even if you guys didn't know that you were acting that way for us. <laughs> uh, we, would, we would look at what uh, UIs were doing and f find the APIs that we needed. Um, our whole CD pipeline uh, actually handles the deployment of things like alerts, even dashboards, all, all types of things in New Relic is just part of our infrastructure as code mentality. Uh, so when Luke came over and started to say, hey, wouldn't it be nice if we didn't just have to build our own panes of glass that sometimes used New Relic data? Uh, we certainly would fire off Nurkle queries from our own tooling. Uh, but now we can actually give you the static bits and you host that. And we get it in context of the other, the other great things like APM that we can look at. Gotcha. So yeah, we see, we see a lot of value and uh, we invested pretty quickly. We sent someone to Chicago. Uh, so Eric worked with uh, that group of people. Obviously, the status page thing is the one that, that Lou mentioned this morning. I expect we'll have two or three more uh, that we'll release uh, uh, in the open source space before the end of the year. That's great. Glenn told me yesterday that uh, Lou actually showed up in his office and like they like went uh, went inside his, Glenn's office for an hour and a half and just coded for an hour and a half and yep. then like Lou disappeared again. I'm like that sounds. I don't think anybody actually knew he was there. It yeah, was, he just was... like he was just there to code. Yep. Like, man of the mission. CEO so, Dev Ninja. Yep. Um, so what's been important like for your teams when, um, you know, when I talked about, uh, you know, you need to be able to see everything, you need to be able to ask questions, but how do, how do your teams talk to you when they come and maybe they like knock on your door and say, hey, you, you know, you're supposed to be helping us make this better. Here's some of what we need. What are you hearing from them? Um, so we definitely heard a lot, like I say, around the, uh, the serverless aspect. So mm -hmm. some of the things that were announced um, uh, at the conference here are, are near and dear to us on that front. Uh, so they are usually asking for more visibility. Um, sometimes we definitely, as I said, we have a distributed tracing problem to solve. Uh, and we feel like we're, we're fairly far along that path, but there's still a lot more to do. So that's probably one of the, the other big sets of, of kind of preponderances that they come to the architecture team with. Um, like we've got some new technology, we've got this thing like, now, what, now I got some Lambda, what do I do with this? Or now I'm like, so how, help me figure out how to connect my new architectures. Into uh, this. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, sometimes it's new tech, uh, sometimes it's agent level information that we need that's just not, not there. Uh, again, one of the biggest things I can tell everybody in the room to do is actually invest in, uh, in, in making your tools better and work for you. Uh, you guys like to obviously believe that there's a lot of magic in the agent, and there is, uh, but the real value comes when you start adding business attributes and uh, other pieces of key data to it, that's when you can actually start answering questions and not just looking at raw data. Uh, so often that's the other type of guidance we get uh, is what things do we actually care about? How should we enrich our data pipelines so that we can actually answer business questions? Mm -hmm. uh, and the other part is we make that part of our, uh, our normal fire drill uh, kind of escapades that the team does. We, we do lots of chaos engineering. Oh yeah. Uh, absolutely. We've got our, our own uh, serverless chaos tool that we'll be releasing hopefully this year as well, if okay. not beginning of next year. Uh, and New so Relic wait, does it, plays I gotta a ask, part does of it that. have a cool name? Because like they're always like gremlins and monkeys and like what? Erebus. Erebus and, is the, our, our okay. lord of chaos here. All right. Okay. Had to ask. Anyway, so sorry, you're, you've got your own. Uh... Yeah. So as part of that, uh, we leverage things like New Relic during those fire drills and events to sort of understand how the system performed, mm -hmm. uh, how it reacted to whatever 
perturbance we, we put into it. Uh, but we also use it for things like performance analysis. Mm -hmm. So for us, performance is great, and like it's, it's wonderful to try to get things tuned to be as performant as possible. Scaling is more important to us, and I, I draw a line between the two. Like I would much rather have a system that can grow double its size and handle double the workload, even if it was 10% less efficient than it could be. Mm -hmm. I would much rather people focus on the horizontal scaling problem first. Uh, and New Relic is one of the key ways that we look to understand how well we actually are doing on that mission. Gotcha. You sort of like run, mo so you, you use it to sort of model the future then to like look at where this might go? We absolutely do. Yeah, we've, uh, we've got data that comes out of, uh, both out of AWS and out of New Relic that we put into kind of our modeling system mm -hmm. and, and our own internal tools that we use for cost optimization mm -hmm. uh, and cost transparency. I'm gonna check out, I heard there's a new one you can check out. Yeah, yeah. well, we already got one. Okay. We'll probably use that one too, okay. we'll, uh, likely. Uh, maybe we'll turn ours into an alert. Yeah. We'll, we'll have to see. Uh, but that's, that's proven very useful. For most engineering teams, I think it's been a problem of observability is why they don't make certain choices. If they don't know a thing needs to be improved, how would they possibly do it? Uh, and cost is one of those things that usually teams don't necessarily have as much optics for. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've tried to put that front and center in their face. Uh, and I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to the other types of things that Nerdlets will let us also put in their face. Gotcha. So you already mentioned like the importance of like adding that business data, like customer attributes um, to your software. Is there any other advice you'd have for folks who maybe, you know, sometimes we have people show up at FutureStack who haven't been using New Relic very long, or maybe they're new on a team that's been using New Relic for a long time and they're just learning it themselves. Like what advice, other advice would you give? Ooh, uh, yeah, other than just that investment part, um, I think start with, start with questions first. That's usually what I say to all analytics teams, honestly. Yeah. Um, just going from a morass of data and trying to find things. Uh, it can be rewarding. I mean, that's the whole point of BI, right, is that you don't know the question exactly. Uh, and Insight certainly makes that uh, achievable. But I think the real, the real value comes if you start with a question and work your way towards how I'm going to answer it. That's, that's a good thing to do. Uh, and invest a lot in understanding. I assume most folks in the room probably are, are in the same space uh, with event streaming, with moving towards more asynchronous systems. Uh, don't underestimate how much better your tracing for that can get if you invest a little bit in understanding that asynchrony part. It works just as much within a service that has like you know, high threading or whatever, uh, but definitely works for uh, distributed pub sub, message buses, if you're using Kafka, if you're using uh, cloud pub sub, if you're using SQS. Like, investing in that part to stitch things together, to, to hint mm -hmm. basically to the New Relic platform how to draw some of that context, super, super important. That's when you'll get much more value. You can connect it, right? Indeed. Uh, um, so I, men uh, I mentioned our customer advisory board earlier. Glenn's actually a member of our customer advisory board and has been, and so I'll give you an open forum then as your last question. Like, What do you want to see next from New Relic or ah. what advice do you have for us? Ooh, and, unfettered uh, wish list. Uh, if I were picking up maybe one big one, um, understanding how the shape of the system changes, uh, that's, that's kind of critical to, to my role. Understanding how the market changes uh, is one thing and we have to interpret that. Understanding how the technology changes and how to apply it is another part of the job. But we have, like I say, 350 plus microservices in production. We have over a thousand lambdas in production. Uh, and these all constitute a pretty pretty rich web of, mm -hmm. of contextual information. Uh, so while we are learning how to stitch all of that together, how we're able to look at aggregates around transactions, which I think is mm -hmm. one additive ask, um, I think being able to see a delta over time, mm -hmm. tell, tell me when things change. I think that'll apply just as much for like architectural governance and, and actually building a more sustainable and reliable system, but it also probably plays to like your compliance teams and your security audits and a number of other kind of capabilities. So like when I showed you that service map earlier, would you like to be able to roll that back and say, yeah, but yesterday yep. it too, what did it look yep. like? Yep, I want a little time brush yeah. back okay. and forth and, and show me how the shape of things yeah. occurred within the context even of a given transaction or mm -hmm. transaction type. Like your, uh, your, your normal shopping cart transaction, yeah. for example, if suddenly we've added a, a new fulfillment uh, microservice and I can go back and forth through a deploy and actually see when that workload changed and see what the impact of that, maybe to AppDex, maybe to error rate, maybe to something else. Um, I think that would be a super useful addition. Great, thanks. Change and comparisons are always important. Great. Um, all right, that, we're gonna wrap it up now. I wanna say thank you to Glenn for joining us on stage and thank you all. Um, thank you.